Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about the pasta lesion of the rotator cuff, which Dr. Zhang uh, kindly introduced to be a very exciting talk, but I, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'll try to make it. Well, outlines of my talks are what is pasta lesion, what causes pasta, signs and symptoms, imaging and treatment. What is pasta lesion? First, let's look at the anatomy of the rotator cuff tendon. It is composed of five layers. The layer one is the extension of the coracohumeral ligament. Layer two is a tendon proper, the thick collagen fibers running parallel. Layer three is an oblique collagen fibers. Layer four, this is another reflection of the coracohumeral ligament. And layer five is the capsule. So this is the uh, cross-section of the uh, anterior, middle, posterior part of the supraspinatus tendon. As you see, the layer two is the thickest part, the main part of the tendon. And if you go posteriorly, you see the uh, covering by the infraspinatus tendon. And the articular side tear, or pasta lesion, occurs from the capsule, and then layer four, three, and then the main part, layer two, and eventually it'll be a full thickness tear. PASTA is the acronym of uh, partial thickness, articular sided, supraspinatus tendon avulsion. So it's a PASTA. So in the operating room, it looks like this. And in the restaurant, it looks like this. It's a uh, lip smacking, <laughs> mouth watering food. But anyway, uh, the classification by Elman is commonly used. Grade one, less than three millimeters. Grade two, three to six millimeters. Grade three, more than six millimeters. And Snyder incorporated the, not only the depth, but also the extent of the tear into his classification. Uh, this is Elman's classification at grade one, less than three or less than one fourth of the thickness. Grade two, less than half. Grade three, more than half. And Habermeyer not only classified the uh, extent of the tear on the coronal plane, but also he classified the tear based on the sagittal plane and the extension, the injury to the, to the biceps pulley and the isolated tear of the supraspinatus and the combination of them. The natural history of articular side rotator cuff tear is this. Yamanaka and Matsumoto, they followed 40 articular sided tear patient for two years, and they performed arthrography. 80% of them increased in tear size, 10% decreased in tear size, 10% complete disappearance. Well, we don't know whether it really disappeared or healed because they used arthrography, so it may be a technical issue. But anyway, 80% of the articular side tears expanded in, in its size. This is another study by Mall, and they followed up 195 patients with asymptomatic cuff tears for two years, and pain appeared in 44 patients and they compared 44 with pain versus 55 without pain. And the painful group showed that 40% of the partial thickness tears extended deep enough to be full thickness tears. 18% of full thickness tears expanded more than five millimeters. So this study tells us that when the tear gets deeper or gets larger, then pain is accompanied with that. What is the prevalence of a pasta lesion? According to the cadaveric studies, interartinous uh, tear is the most common type of a partial thickness tear. It's twice as common as the articular sided tear, three times more common than bursal side tear. However, the clinical data showed that articular side tear is far, by far the most common type of a partial thickness tear. This is probably because the uh, difficulty in making a diagnosis of partial thickness tears, especially intratendinous tears. What causes pasta lesion? Etiology is multifactorial. Intrinsic factor is an age-related degeneration of the tendon. Extrinsic factors is a subacromial impingement. 
as the Dr. John just explained, internal impingement, instability, single trauma, or repetitive microtrauma. Well, we know that the uh, age-related degeneration is uh, progressed on the articular side of the supraspinatus tendon. Uh, there are a lot of studies showing that, and also there are many studies showing that age-related weakening of the tendon occurs, especially on the articular side. This is a 54-year-old man's uh, supraspinatus tendon. This is intact. We use this specimen to perform the finite element model analysis. And with the arm in abduction, there is a high stress concentration. This is a tensile stress on the articular side of the supraspinatus tendon near its insertion to the greater tuberosity. And this stress concentration is exactly the same as the tear side that we see in the clinical cases. And once the articular side tear is created, then there's another stress concentration at the bottom of the tear that may aggravate or deepen this tear until it becomes the full thickness tear. Another mechanism is the throwing motion. If the patient has, cannot rotate the trunk enough, then they try to hyperextend the arm that causes the internal impingement, and as Jilval sh said, there's a shear stress uh, occurring on the articular side of the uh, supraspinatus tendon, and eventually the posterior lesion may occur. And also the ultimate failure stress, this is the definition of the strength in the biomechanical field, and the strength of the articular side is much weaker than the strength of the personal side. So all these things may explain why the pasta lesion occurs in throwing athletes. Signs and symptoms. When the cough tear patient comes to see us, most of them, 90% come to see us because of pain, 10% pain plus weakness, and only 1% come to see us because of muscle weakness. We look at the location of the pain, anterior and lateral, we compare those with full thickness tears, an articular side pasta lesion, and the bursa side tear. And th they all show the same trend. The, the anterior uh, pain is very common, and also the lateral pain is very common. We cannot differentiate them by the location of the motion pain. What about impingement sign? Well, the bursa side tear has a very high uh, prevalence of the impingement sign compared to other types of tears, but there's no difference between full thickness and pasta lesion. And the pain seems to come from subacromial bursitis because uh, Christian Gerber injected the hypertonic saline into the subacromial bursa, and pain occurred on the anterior to lateral lesion of the shoulder. So the, the pain that we see in the cough tear patient may come from the inflammation of the subacromial bursa. Imaging modalities, MR arthrography has a very high sensitivity, high specificity for the detection of the partial articular side cuff tears. And some say the MR arthrography with the arm in abduction exonotation is the same as the one taken with the arm in adduction, the conventional position. But others say the MRA taken with abduction exonotation is better in terms of sensitivity. Ultrasonography also has a very high sensitivity and specificity, but in terms of detecting the articular sided tear, the detection rate is only 41%. The meta analysis showed, including 65 articles, MR arthrography is the most sensitive and specific technique for diagnosing both full thickness and partial thickness cuff tears, and ultrasound and MRI are comparable in both sensitivity and specificity. In my institute, we use this special uh, device to get high-resolution MRI. This is a conventional uh, shoulder coil. It's large. And together with this conventional coil, we use this uh, small coil. This is called a microscopic coil with a 3.5 inch diameter. And the combination of these two coils gives us a very high resolution MRI. The full thickness tears, the diagnostic accuracy is 100%. 
and partial thickness tears, 97% is the same or a little better than MR arthrography, far better than MRI. For example, this is the regular MRI. You cannot see any tear, but using high-resolution MRI, you can clearly see the pasta lesion and the you know, diagnostic arthroscopy clearly reveals this lesion. Treatment, the conservative treatment should come first, and NSAIDs, steroid injection, physical therapy, stretching and heat modalities. For throwers, throwing form re-education is necessary and the strengthening of cuff and periscapular muscles. I think uh, Ben will tell us uh, all about this in his lecture later. And the indication for surgery, there's a general consensus that when the depth of the pasta is less than 50%, just do the Breedman. If the depth is more than 50%, repair it. But for the young, active patient, when the depth is uh, deeper than 30%, repair it. That's a general consensus. How effective is the debridement? This is a study, 79 patient were treated by debridement alone, and the 77% of them had labral abnormalities. And the UCLS score showed that 89% were good to excellent within five year of, years of follow-up, but after that, it de decreased a little bit down to 81%. And when, if you want to repair the tear, there are two types of technique. One is a tear completion and repair. The other one is a trans tendon repair. Uh, which is better? This is a 80, uh, study comparing the 48 patients randomly assigned to one group is a trans tendon repair. The other group is tendon completion, a tear completion and repair group. 92% in each group were satisfied. And uh, for those in the trans tendon repair group, the complete tendon healing was observed, but the recovery was slow. Those in the tear completion group, recovery was much faster, but eventually there's no difference between them. Recently, there's a systematic review of 16 studies showing that there is no difference in clinical outcome between the transtendon repair and the tear completion repair. Recently, there's a, a new technique to repair everything uh, by all inside repair technique, everything from the articular side and the no major stiffness after the surgical repair. And the, some report shows that transtendon repair may cause a shoulder stiffness after the repair. And this is because this is a normal tendon, and this is the pasta lesion. If you repair the, this lesion through the trans tendon repair technique or all inside technique, there's always a redundancy on the superficial layer. So if you do tear completion and repair, you can avoid this redundancy of the superficial layer, but still you make the shoulder stiff because it shortens this length of the tendon. This is our data. We always do the tear completion and repair in 14 cases, and the before operation and the after operation. The flexion improved a little bit, but external rotation decreased eight degrees on average. <coughs> Internal rotation the same. So this may be okay for ordinary people, but for the throwing athletes, this is not acceptable. For the throwing shoulders, Iwaho re reported that if you do arthroscopic cuff repair for the throwing athletes, full return to throwing is only 33%. And if you do debridement, functional deficit still remains. If you repair, then shortening of the tendon occurs, and eventually there's a limitation in the range of motion. So he said tissue engineering may be necessary. Yokoya used a PGA, it's a polyglycolic poly acid sheet, PGA sheet, as a scaffold, and which promotes tendon regeneration, and they used uh, mesenchymal stem cells to, into, uh, to promote the type 1 collagen and improve mechanical strength. So this is a pasta lesion, 
And if you do a uh, tissue engineering technique, you can regenerate the tendon. This would probably be the ideal situation to occur. And Mochizuki performed this uh, PGA sheet to attach to the articular side lesion defect. And they performed 24 baseball pitchers, articular side tear, and the 17 cases were treated by arthroscopic cuff repair, and seven of them were treated by this uh, PGA sheet technique. Cuff repair group, external rotation was limited uh, 7.5 degrees on average, but PGA group, no limitation. Return to throwing, 82% versus 100%. So this may be an excellent technique. And this is the summary of surgical outcome of for pasta lesion in the throwers. Uh, they do debridement or trans tendon repair, PGA sheet. And definitely this is the best, but the number is so small, so we need further studies. So in summary, pasta lesion is a common lesion in throwers, pain during throwing motion. MRA is better than plain MRI or ultrasound, but both of them are useful. Conservative treatment, such as stretching, range of motion, especially for the trunk or upper and lower extremities are necessary. And the surgical treatment is a debridement, may be safe because we can avoid the stiff shoulder. And if you repair the tear, then you always have a risk of loss of motion. So tissue regeneration may be necessary. This is the future direction to go. Thank you for your attention.